And so for those of you who like titles, I'm just going to take God's word for it and borrow it out of the last part of chapter 12. Call it a more excellent way. Because this is the greatest thing that there is. There isn't anything greater. And Paul probably has the most authority as an instrument. We know God wrote the whole Bible. That's the whole Bible. Every book, every word. And he inspired it through the power of the Holy Spirit. But he did choose which instrument to write what through. And he's right when he makes that choice. And so I think with the Apostle Paul, in which will become obvious, these truths that the Lord is speaking are even more powerful by virtue of the instrument that he's choosing. So here we begin in verse 1. He says, look, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And just to give you a, a little bit of the context, I think we all know if you read chapter 12, which immediately precedes this, the Apostle Paul, uh, the Apostle to the Gentiles, personally taught by Jesus, did not receive his doctrine from men. It was not secondhand. This is part of the New Testament church, is telling the New Testament church to earnestly seek the gifts of the Spirit. He's talking about very powerful gifts, which is, in fact, what Jesus said. He said to his disciples, I want you to remain here because you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you will be my witnesses to the whole world. I will send you out in power. So Jesus cared about the body expressing these gifts. They're tools for a job. They bring him glory. And the apostle Paul is telling the church how important that is. But he was led by that Holy Spirit in the middle of explaining about how the Holy Spirit works in the particular gifts, in the particular saints, which are members, many, of one single body of Christ, he felt compelled, impelled would be a better word, he was drawn by the Holy Spirit to explain, look, all the power in the world is meaningless, meaningless, if it is not moving in the direction of love, if it is not motivated by love, then it will not yield anything that's valuable. So when he opens up, he says, if I speak with tongues of men and angels, but don't have love, it's nothing but noise. Now, I like cymbals. You know, I play the drums. I enjoy it. I'll tell you something about that. It's brash. It's loud. It gets your attention when you hear a cymbal crash, but it is gone. The instant. It makes the noise, and then it's over. What's the lasting effect? It's nothing. And here he's picking eloquence, which I think is important. I certainly set my sights on it. I'll tell you, most people value this. We look at eloquence and we think, well, that's pretty close to godliness. But I'll tell you somebody who was eloquent. You think about it. I like to get my examples out of the Bible. Do you recall what happened to King Herod? Now, I'm amazed that God did not just reduce him to a pile of smoldering ashes when he mocked Jesus to his face, but he chose not to. But then, afterwards, he stood and he gave a speech before a large audience. And people were so powerfully moved by that speech, they were crying out, the voice of a God and not of a man. Great eloquence. And he didn't give glory to God in that moment, and so God struck him dead. He disintegrated on the spot. That's an amazing thing. But what do you think? Did Herod have love? No, he didn't. I mean, his behavior is... Some of the most vile and repugnant behavior that I witness in the Bible, when I see that, that's a good example of how not to be. His eloquence did not yield forth any life. There's no positive, lasting effect from that. Or, I'll tell you who, the, well, consider Hitler from history. Think about that. You know one of his greatest skills was oratory. He was a very eloquent man. If you ever watch those videos, it's astonishing. You can watch the power of his word on that crowd. And I mean, it's a huge crowd, just like a sea of human beings there assembled. And as he's speaking forth, you can see that power. What was the effect of all of that eloquence? It wasn't directed in the direction of love. The result was massive murder on a scale never before seen, industrialized murder. So Paul is right in that 
Well, let me give you the ultimate example of that. You think Satan's eloquent? Yeah. Yeah, he's subtle. He's eloquent. It's a very dangerous thing to listen to him. We don't ever have any business listening to him. Best we can do is answer him back with the word and get on, get gone. Because he can just plant a little subtle doubt, just a hint, just a spin on the truth that will find ground and begin to grow and corrupt you. And before you know it, look at the effect on him. He created a lie. He started to nurse it. And eventually he went from the anointed covering cherub to the enemy of God who would fight against him, hated God, and is self-destructive, has been bent on utter destruction from the time of that fall. So it's plain what Paul is saying, and that should inform us. You know, I, I'll be honest, I've, I've watched a lot of preaching from a lot of different people, and there are so many that I've learned from and that I admire. But you know, eloquence in the absence of love is not accomplishing anything good. So I would hold them up, I would look at them, and I would say, man, I mean, that, that guy must really love the Lord. But when you investigate their lives, you see that they make a habit out of breaking his commandments. Now, I don't know what they understand. I don't. There's been plenty of time. I'm sure there are things I will learn yet. I know that there are. The Lord will show me, and I'll have to change that I'm not currently doing. And I know there were things in my past that I didn't know and understand and that I didn't do. I hope that's where they are. I do. But I know that there are some, and I've spoken with some, counseled with some, begged some, who know better, who do but that choose to do it a different way for whatever motive, for whatever reason, whether that's pleasing man, whether that's obtaining uh, status, comfort in their life, a paycheck. So all of those things. Sometimes it's for family. You know, they just esteem their family above the Lord and they won't have their family look at them like they're some weirdo because they're following the Lord instead of nominal Christianity. That happens. But you can't, you see, you can't really esteem somebody based on that. It's good for us to learn how to speak. That's good. The Lord knew how to do that, and that's right. But we don't esteem it. We understand that's a vehicle. It'd be like if you received a gift and you were all about the package, right? That's crazy. Well, that's all. And that's what he's saying. It's subservient to love. Verse 2, if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and have all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and don't have love, I am nothing. And he's right. Love is the most important thing. I mean, first, knowing everything. There, again, is a deep thing that he's addressing. It's a thing that we look at. We ourselves strive to know and to learn, to understand things. And we esteem people who have, people who have worked hard and who know. And that's how we tend to, we think, well, that person, and I've done that with people, we know so much. I mean, he must be a genuinely godly man. That's a trap. Knowing things is fine, but this is a knowledge, what, what Paul is talking about when he's talking about love, that's a knowledge that's much deeper than any intellectual acquisition that you can make. It is the greatest and deepest thing, and it, it is as incomparable as the difference between heaven and earth. There just is no comparison between knowing the Lord and just knowing things. And again, I instruct you, think about the Bible. I mean, the smartest person that I can think of in the Bible would be Solomon. Solomon was given a gift because he was such an excellent young man. And the Lord offered him anything. Just, you ask for anything. And his heart was so good, he saw how important it was to rule God's people. He saw the weight of that trust and responsibility he said, Lord, give me wisdom so that I can do this in a way that glorifies you, that pleases you, that blesses your people. That was a good thing to ask for. And the Lord gave it to him and so much more besides. Wealth untold. So here he is, wisest man except for Jesus who ever lived. What's his life? He was without love by the end. He did the very thing that God told him not to do. He would have written it with his own hand, rolled it up and had it in his pocket. Don't multiply wives to yourselves, to yourself. If you do and you marry all these foreign brides, what's going to happen is they will turn your heart. Your heart will turn. This beautiful heart that pleases me so well that I want to bless, that heart will get twisted and perverted and will turn and you will be blind. You won't even know it. It's exactly what happened to Solomon, isn't it? Across from the Lord's temple, 
which he built. I mean, his father David couldn't build it. His hands were bloody. So he gathered everything up. And David's whole heart was to building this temple. He loved the Lord. And even though he couldn't himself do it, he got everything together for it to be accomplished. Right across from that, he had a temple to a pagan god offering pagan sacrifices. So, I mean, he was not, did he know everything? No, but he was as close as a man has ever been. And what's the result without love? Look, read Ecclesiastes, and you see what he says. It's all vanity. He's saying himself, the, the fruit of that was empty, it was vain, it was meaningless. That's what I turned all this into. So we don't esteem that, not over much. Fine, it's fine to know things. It's even good for us to grow up in knowledge, but understand always, and I mean, essentially, that's what Paul is doing here. Knowledge is a power, but it's subservient to love. Love is the main thing. It's the highest good. It's the most noble cause. God is love. It's who he is. Not just how he behaves, not just what he does. It's who he is. We set our sights on growing into the fullness of the stature of Christ all the way up to be a help meet for him. Meet, and that idea is well-matched, something that is adequate isn't exactly the right word, but it's, it's like saying it's a perfect complement to him. Do you follow? As we will be his bride for eternity. That's what we aim at. Love, it is the greatest thing. And as he says, look, if I have faith to move mountains and don't have love, I'm nothing. That's right. Power without love is meaningless. It's just meaningless. You can have a lot of power. I noticed under Pharaoh's rule, when Moses was sent down there by God to deliver the people of Israel, as he had promised, even 430 years older, I mean, farther back, he told him what was going to happen. He called the shot. That's how you know it's God doing it. And in the midst of that, you notice that in the courts, in Pharaoh's courts, he had magicians that could do powerful things. Do you notice that? Amazing things, really, when you think about it. There's power out there. What's being accomplished by that power? You know, I'm mindful of Matthew 7. You know, I think about what the Lord was saying when he said, you know, there are going to be those who come to me and they're going to talk about all that they did in my name. And they'll talk about this power. They'll say, I cast out demons in your name. I healed the sick in your name. I performed miracles in your name. What are they doing? Works and power. Isn't that what they're citing? He's going to say, look, I, didn't even, I never knew you. You practice breaking my commandments, which, by the way, means you don't have love. They define love. If how you are is in line with his commandments, it means that you are acting in love. It means that you are like your Father in heaven. That's what it is. So, I mean, all the power in the world, and we esteem power, but we should put it in the right spot. Look, if you want to evaluate yourself, and we all should from time to time, we don't need to get out of balance with it, but if you're asking yourself, you're performing self-examination, how am I doing in the Lord? How am I doing in Him? Please, don't be measuring, well, I've memorized this many more verses. I've read the Bible through this many more times. I've devoted this many more hours to prayer. All of those fine things, good things. Question to ask yourself is, do I love like Jesus? Do I love more? Am I more like that? That's the question. That's the question. My favorite scripture probably in the whole Bible is Galatians 2, I mean, chapter 2, verse 20. I'm crucified with Christ. And yet... I live, but it's not I who live. Christ lives in me. That's the question. Is Jesus living more in you? We stopped to pray last night. The pastor was moved to have us do that quietly and individually. That's the thing that the Lord showed me. That was the revelation. Every time, number one, that I received love, and I had lots of times that I could think about so many, just so many. And he was showing me that's me. That was me, son. I love you. It was me showing my love through this one, through that one, in this moment, that moment. And then all of the things that he's accomplished through me, he's saying, that's me. I'm living in you. You know, that kind word, even sometimes that hard word, sometimes that rebuke. Because love isn't always pleasant. It's just always good. It's always in the interest of the one whom you are loving, you see. That's a very powerful thing. So, the quintessential question is, is Jesus living in you? Are you loving more? What's your love quotient? 
He says in verse 3, look, if I give everything I have to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned but don't have love, it profits me nothing. There's no profit in it. Now, Jesus knew that. I think he's the prime example in the Bible. If you're going to compare putting physical food in people's bodies, bringing them physical healing, things that we associate with like Mother Teresa or the Red Cross, fine and noble things. I'm not speaking against that. I am making a comparison. I am using the comparison of Paul and the example of Jesus' life. Jesus fed the hungry, did he not? Jesus healed the sick, did he not? And yet to those very people, he said, you're coming here looking for bread and you're going to be hungry again in four hours. I'm not interested in giving you the best 70, 80 years you can have. I'm here to save your soul. I'm here to give you eternal life. Don't be looking for that bread that perishes. The bread of life is in front of you. See, that's the point. That's the main thing is saving souls. So you could give your whole life if you wanted to. Give all of your possessions to house those who have no homes, to feed those who don't have food, or to render medical care to those who are sick. And those are all fine things. But if you don't seek after first the salvation of your own soul, and then, out of thankfulness, the salvation of every other soul that the Lord sends you in front of, because he loves them, and he's not wasting your life. I mean, this is something I've had to come to terms with to learn and try to understand. If the Lord brings somebody in front of me, I'm the correct instrument. It means I'm right. Well, with all my faults and failings and shortcomings, and if you want a list, I just I don't have enough paper. There's a lot of them. It's like the book of what I don't know. It's a pretty long list. Yeah, but that's not the point, is it? What's my strength? The Lord lives in me. It's him. It's him. It's not me. I save no one. My job, show up, yield, that's it. Everybody can do that. And that's power, see, that's genuine love. But what's the benefit if you're Gandhi? Okay, a nation is freer. That's a wonderful thing. Are they going to have eternal life? Are they free from the guilt of sin? That's the question. That's the most important thing. So, verse 4. Here he's describing this is how love is. Every time I look at this, I think about Jesus and how he behaved because he's the ultimate example. He says, love is patient. I don't... I hate sometimes what happens to words over time. They start out often with very strong meanings, and over time, their meanings are just watered down. The root of the word patience is the same as the root of the word passion. And by that, that's another word that's kind of watered down. Why do we call watching what happened to Jesus on the cross a passion play? You ever wondered about that? Because pati, the root word, it means to suffer. That's what it means. Love will suffer. I like the way the King James puts it. I think it's more accurate. Love suffers long. You will suffer. Are you willing to suffer your whole life? Well, that's what we're called to. It doesn't mean, I'm not saying, God's not saying, you won't have joy and you won't have peace. We'll have that. And his presence too. With suffering. The suffering is necessary. It was suffering that brought the Lord to me both the Father's and the Lord's. And it was my own suffering that brought me to him. And sometimes the suffering accomplished in me brings him to others. Praise the Lord. Is it worth it? That's a good trade. I'll take that trade every time. You mean to say that this weakening of you, this frustration of your hopes and dreams, that this pain or this anguish, you mean to say that that is building a stage where the Lord can stride in? where he can set a captive free, where he can bring peace to a troubled mind, where he can bring life where there was death. Yes, Lord, use me like that. Do it exactly as you see fit. Get every ounce of glory you can out of my life. You deserve it. Love is patient. It will suffer. Love is kind. That's a good word, kind. I mean, kindness, again, I would instruct you, it means that you're acting in the interest of the one that you're interacting with. That's all. Sometimes kindness is gentle. Sometimes kindness is hard, harsh, direct. Sometimes. I'll tell you what's kind to say to a person who is on fire 
is you're on fire and I'm putting you out. And don't worry about hurting their feelings when you knock them down with the fire blanket. You're saving their life. That's kind. But it's not very polite, is it? You see what I'm saying? I think churchianity has that wrong. They think it's always about smiling and saying soft and smooth things. The only one I know who does that is Satan. The Lord will say a hard thing if it will save you, if it will heal you, because he cares, see. And of course, sometimes it's a tender thing. The Lord knows what the person in front of you needs. So he will move you to be tender, and he will move you to be tough. And look, if it feels weird, let it be weird. It's okay, because he's right. And if you practice it long enough, you'll find out he's right every time. I mean, you don't second-guess the Lord. If you're going to second-guess somebody, second-guess you and how you're feeling. The Lord is right. I've seen it over and over, and I've made that mistake, let me be clear, so many times. That's the reason I say that with emphasis is because, I mean, I regret every time that I tried to take over or steer or spin, you know, or put some kind of polish on. Look, just do it the way the Lord says. You'll look really smart in the end. That's... Uh, Truly wisdom, no doubt. It's not jealous. Now, I know that seems like a small thing. Let me tell you, it ain't a small thing. It's not. Anybody know, Did you remember in the New Testament when Pilate discerned why the Jews had come to bring Jesus and kill him, crucify him? Why? Amen. It was jealousy. That's what they saw. It's not a small thing. Jealousy really is what... Lucifer had when he looked at the Lord and saw his glory and realized, well, my glory is not quite as big as his glory. So it was jealousy that started him down that path of a lie that caused him to make, to create the first lie that I ought to be in charge and he's trying to keep me down. He really doesn't want what's good for me. I'd be better off if I ascended and took the throne over myself. I should have that. And look where it led. Look, look at the bloody legacy of that. Jealousy, Cain and Abel. Abel's deeds were righteous, Cain's were evil. He hated him. What did that lead him to? Murder. It created, caused murder. Joseph's brother sold him into slavery. Same reason. It's not a small thing. And love's not jealous. Why? Well, two reasons. The overarching reason, I mean, the most important reason is, you think God is holding something good back from you? Would he do that? I mean, ask yourself that, honestly. Honestly. He gave Jesus. What's he keeping back from you that you could handle, that would be good for you? Nothing, right? So that's number one, to get it straight. Number two, he doesn't love the other person more at all. He loves you. You individually, put your name on it, will give you everything that is good for you. And he's got eternity in mind, so please remember that when you do your math. I mean, it doesn't seem like a blessing, does it, to spend 12 years on the run with the whole army of Israel chasing you, living in caves and having a bunch of the dregs of society attached to you. That doesn't sound great. Why did God do that to David? To make him king of all of Israel, to bless him, to give him a legacy that we talk about every Sabbath, by the way, right? God's got eternity in mind. You could say the same thing. Joseph, Daniel, pick somebody. It's all like that. He knows what he's doing. So love is not jealous. Love cares about what's good for the other person. You want it. You rejoice when somebody is blessed. That's what you want. Why? Well, it it ain't about you. It's really about the Lord. So when, when that happens, that brings glory to the Lord, and we're happy about that. See, it says love does not brag and is not arrogant. So... The hardest measure I know, and I only learned this maybe a year ago, I see that our time is dwindling down, so we'll stop here. If arrogant people offend you, you are arrogant. Yeah, that's a hard truth, but it's true. It's a tough measuring stick, but when you see somebody and they're being cocky, if that really makes you livid, it means that you are arrogant, you see. The opposite of arrogance is Jesus. I mean, the pinnacle of that, the measure of it is... He's king of the universe. The kind of glory that he's had for all eternity would melt us in the flesh if we saw it. So great. The description of it makes you shake when you try to enter that presence in the spirit. I know we can't do it naturally. How did he show up? Look how he came to us. Look how humble he was. It's the opposite of arrogance. He never sounded a trumpet in front of himself. 
But you know, he's the only one that if he did it, he'd be right. That's his glory, all of it. All glory, all honor, all power, all majesty. They belong to him by right. But he didn't go around pronouncing it. There was nothing about him. He chose to come humbly to a humble family in a humble place. He was arrayed humbly. He didn't even stand out from other people. And imagine, I mean, I try to wrap my mind around this. What does it mean that your creator, the one with that power that should make your knees tremble a little bit when you think he's holding everything together by that power? He spoke and it was. What kind of power is that? And the, this gets to me, I don't know if it does to you. The more I study things, and I'm interested, I like learning things. The more I see his inexhaustible, incomprehensible genius. Look where you will. Vision, consciousness, human anatomy, cosmology, physiology, physics. I don't care wherever you look. And you go about an inch deep and you know it goes miles and miles and light years. You could keep going and that's him. But that he comes to us. He condescends to us. He speaks to us in a language that we understand. He gets down into the dirt and filth of our sin and identifies with us. That's humility. And without his humility, then none of us could be saved. So when we're evaluating ourselves, I mean, it's the first thing. It's not knowledge. It's not power. It's not eloquence. It's not. It's love. It's patience. It's being kind. It's not being jealous, but rather seeking the good of everyone, wanting what's good for everyone. Opposite of jealousy is being thankful for what the Lord's given you and acknowledging and recognizing that he's right. You know, he's right. And being humble like the Lord, there's nothing greater. It is, it is the most excellent way. Hallelujah.